Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to Logan Larson, Mike Akins, Norm Fazekas, and brand new patrons Matthew, Karen, Crudelise, and RTJ. A bunch of new patrons. On this episode of DTNS, the tech you need to hunt tardigrades in Antarctica, what tech neuroscientists use in their daily work, and Shannon Morse gives us her first impressions on the Quest 3S. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 21st, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Thanks to everybody for letting us experiment with DTNS on Friday. Uh, We appreciate it. We are back to the usual way of doing things today, uh, which means we shall start with the quick hits. As expected, Google received a stay on most of the orders that would have forced it to open up the Google Play Store and payment system on November 1st. I tried to tell everyone the stay was ordered by Judge Donato, the same judge who ordered the remedy in the first place. Uh, Google has also appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Judge Donato issued the stay on the premise that the Ninth Circuit Court is also going to issue the stay, so you might as well not make him obey for two days or whatever. However, Judge Donato did leave in place one piece of his original order from november 1st until november 1st 2027 google may not make deals with carriers or device makers that prevent those device makers from installing rival app stores microsoft announced 10 new ai agents for its dynamics 365 line of business applications in areas like sales, finance, and supply chain. Agents are programs that can handle tasks autonomously without user interaction. Salesforce is set to launch its own agent force on October 25th. Microsoft agents will be available in public preview later this year. The ability to create agents in Copilot Studio will come in public preview next month. Qualcomm announced its new flagship chipset for phones and laptops coming next year, the 8 Elite is a three nanometer mobile chip with two prime cores and six performance cores. More on the Apple model there. Qualcomm says it should have 45% better performance than the 8 Gen 3 and a faster NPU and GPU. It's got a Qualcomm design too. So they're no longer borrowing from the ARM Cortex design, though it's still the ARM instruction set. So it's still ARM based, uh, just not ARM design. Some phones may include this new chip in announcements to come before the end of the year. Ooh, Apple will release the 18.1 upgrade to iOS launches next week. Uh, Not only is it expected to bring Apple intelligence features to the phone, which we already expected, but it also enables AirPods 2 to be used as hearing aids. Mm. In fact, the release time frame came not from Apple, but from reviews of the hearing aid features. DJI is suing the U.S. Department of Defense over its listing as a Chinese military company, the DOD added DJI to the list in 2022 and reconfirmed it on January 31st this year. The listing prevents the government from using DJI products in military applications, but it has a halo effect on other government agencies and even private companies. The U.S. Commerce Department has also put DJI on an entity list. That prevents U.S. companies from selling certain things to DJI without a license. But this lawsuit is about the DOD thing. Uh, The suit claims there is no significant Chinese government or military involvement in DJI's ownership. It also said that agency justifications for the listing confused people with common names. In other words, they identified someone as being from the Chinese army, but it was a different person with the same name in DJI. Uh, DJI says that the suit relied on stale alleged facts and attenuated connections and is asking the court to declare the listing unconstitutional as a deprivation of due process. We know not one, but two people who have been to Antarctica, so we couldn't pass up the chance to chat with both of them at the same time. Ariel Waldman has a documentary about wildlife in Antarctica, so we got Craig Porter, who was in Antarctica at the time, to join a conversation about what wildlife in Antarctica actually means and what tech Ariel used to shoot her documentary. I'm really excited to talk about the technology of Antarctica with two people who have been there. One who is, as we are speaking, actually still there. Uh, Joining us uh, today, uh, documentarian and uh, person about the internet, Ariel Waldman. Ariel, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
And of course, uh, the person we talked to uh, previously, uh, would you describe yourself as an engineer, Craig? Um, you know, I like to fashion myself as an engineer for sure. Um, yeah. I, I'm not a professional engineer or anything like that, but, you know, I deal with mechanical and electrical things. So, yeah, yeah uh, I think and, that makes and me an engineer. Craig Porter, uh, of course, joining us. Uh, and and what, what do you do in Antarctica? For those who I'm haven't seen lead, you talk to us before. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the lead power plant mechanic at McMurdo Station. Now, Ariel, we've talked to you before on Daily Tech News Show uh, about Antarctica in relation to the series uh, that you published about it. But you're also working on a documentary uh, that will be coming out soonish. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, where you are in that process and, and what that's about. Yeah, so my uh, my most recent expedition to Antarctica, I went to um, a location that a uh, hundred plus years ago was called the Valley of the Dead. Uh, it's the dry valleys in Antarctica. It's one of our closest analogs to Mars. Um, and I had a two-month expedition there, and I wanted to film a wildlife documentary. But the challenge, of course, with a wildlife documentary in the Valley of the Dead is there's not noticeably any life. Mm. All of it is actually invisible. It's <laughs> microscopic. Um, but because I'm a microscopist, I thought I was well suited to put together a wildlife documentary of all the microscopic animals that live in this area and show how it's actually full of life. So where I'm at, um, in the process is filmed it all uh, completely solo, no film crew, no assistance, um, which was a lot. Um, and I, uh, finished post-production on it this summer. Um, and I'm now in distribution negotiations on it. So, uh, my hope is that, uh, it'll come out, uh, more publicly, um, next year. Um, but just, just this week, I'm actually flying to the UK, uh, for one of its first, uh, screenings at the Wild Screen Film Festival, uh, in Bristol. So, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you're you're in extreme conditions. Obviously, uh, you're you're going uh, Ariel after small <laughs> small wildlife, very small wildlife. Uh, tell us about the technology that you used to be able to conduct this, both both to get yourself out there safely and back, and and to be able to you know capture the images you're after. Yeah, I mean, so to get there safely and back, I'm uh, doing the same thing that Craig does. I'm I'm going through the National Science Foundation's U.S. Antarctic program, um, and so they handle all the logistics, um, you know, to get from New Zealand to Antarctica. Uh, that's typically using military aircrafts, either uh, C-17s or C-130s. Um, so I have them to thank thank for all of that. Um, to get out to the dry valleys from McMurdo Station. Uh, we use helicopters. So uh, helicopters take us to the dry valleys and back. It's usually around like 45 minutes-ish uh, from McMurdo Station to the dry valleys via helicopter. Um, in terms of the tech that enabled this, this was definitely a, a challenging uh, documentary for a couple of reasons. Um, on the microscopic side, I used uh, my Nikon E200 microscope uh, attached to my Canon R5C camera, um, so mirrorless camera attached to my microscope. Um, I have been doing microscopy for a number of years. It's an uh, interesting discipline because it's something that, on one hand, anyone can do um, very quickly, get a microscope, you know, begin looking at things. Um, so the entry point is very easy. Um, I would say doing... Um, high quality, uh, high resolution footage of microscopic creatures takes a little bit longer to really perfect that sort of um, skill set. But um, but it's something that uh, I've I've been doing for a number of years now. Um, to me, the actually the more interesting tech is the fact that I filmed this entire documentary by myself, um, which was a huge challenge um, for a number of reasons, um, and it felt. Definitely like when I deployed to Antarctica and I was on the bus and I was like about to like head into McMurdo Station before I deployed out to the dry valleys, I was definitely thinking that I must be um, a bit nuts to do this. <laughs> <laughs> like it was it was a lot. So the the tech that enabled me to film myself um, was uh, specifically I used the uh, Axoon Cinei video transmitter. So I was able to set up my Canon camera frame a shot and then 
you know, then I was able to walk in front of that shot and then on my phone, check the focus, um, check the framing so that I was able to like set up the camera and then sit in front of the camera. Um, typically it was like 30 minutes of setup in freezing temperatures. Uh, mm -hmm. and then I could bear about another 30 minutes on camera after that, um, before I started to get too cold. Um, but some of the, the technology was also pretty basic. I, got amazing footage from helicopters using just uh, at my time at the time my iPhone 14 Pro and a DJI gimbal so mm -hmm. a lot of the shots in my documentary um, and there's many where we're just flying above all these really cool mountains and going over glaciers and it's really epic looking and it just looks really clear and stable that's literally just iPhone footage because um, in these helicopters, there's not a lot of space. So I couldn't have like a big long lens set up um, and had to be super mobile. So that was um, really interesting. Craig, I know you're you're into photography yourself. Like, uh, how, how does this sound to you? Would, would you want to go try to do what Ariel did? <laughs> no, I, I have a lot of uh, respect and admiration for Ariel because I'm I'm very much of the uh, phone <laughs> phone photography for sure i have uh, pixel 8 pro it's the same phone i've had the whole time i've been down here and it's been taking pretty decent photos um and you know to to have the patience and to set up you know to do a 30 minute setup you know for a for a shot like that's a which that's is hard a, enough a when you're that, you know a vlogger in a you know a location that's warm and full of other people yeah. right yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a skill that that I and, and a patience that I don't have. So I I, I guess you I, weren't I worried that. about anybody taking your equipment, Ariel. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't have to worry about anyone taking my equipment. I did have to worry about helicopter noise because I would uh -huh. go into these locations and at certain times of day, helicopters are just bringing fuel and supplies to these little remote camps where there's only like five or six people. But there's certain times of day where the helicopters are just like trying to be as efficient as they can. So they're coming in and out. So there's definitely a lot of behind the scenes shots I have of me just kind of like cur quietly cursing out the helicopters because they ruined <laughs> like my, my shot or something. Well, thank you both uh, for being willing to talk, uh, especially using your Starlink connection. Craig to, to demonstrate it. Uh, and Ariel, uh, the documentary sounds fantastic. I'm really looking forward to being able to see more of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got like a tiny teaser up on my YouTube channel. It's my most recent video and, um, and people can join my Patreon, which is just under my own name to get updates on, on when the uh, documentary comes out and also to support it. Fantastic. Craig, anything uh, you want to pass along to folks before we wrap up? Um, no, um, you know, I, I have my own personal website, djfission.com. That's where all my social media is. And also, um, if you're interested in learning more about what the United States Antarctic program is all about, um, I, I don't speak for them. I'm not a NSF or USAP spokesperson, but if you're interested, go to USAP, usap.gov. Fantastic. Thank you both again. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And uh, by the way, we have confirmation uh, that that Craig made it safely back uh, home since we recorded that interview. He's he's back in the U.S. and but he plans to go back again uh, next uh, winter. Uh, so we'll we'll maybe talk to him again from Antarctica. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk to him from you know warmer climes before then too as well. And thanks again, Ariel. I'm really looking forward to to seeing the documentary. There may be a screening coming to L.A., so we'll try to get to that. All right, iFixit published the result of its teardown of the MetaQuest Three which is mostly the same as the Quest 2. Few improvements. Uh, among the differences from the Quest 2 are two infrared sensors for depth mapping, an improvement over the Quest 3. Also has the same chipset as the Quest 3, the Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2. Shannon has had a chance to play with the Quest 3S. Uh, what have you found so far, Shannon? I have, yes. I have been having a lot of fun with this little device. Uh, I currently have mine turned on, so I can actually kind of wear it for you and show you what it looks like Ooh, if nice. you're watching the video. But uh, this one is a little bit bigger than the three. Luckily, I have had an opportunity to play with one of my friends' Quest 3s, as well as I've checked out the Quest 2 back in uh, previously, a few years prior. But this one is pretty good. I mean, given that it's 
$300, I am arguing that this would be like the, the introduction to VR that you can give to your kids, that you could give to yourself if you're interested in it, but you're not quite ready to spend like $500 on one. Uh, this is a really, really good introduction. Do you uh, use it for productivity, games, both? What do you use it for? So far, I've been using it for games. Um, mainly, I am very interested in Beat Saber. Like, I love that game. <laughs> so, of course, that's the one that everybody plays. But I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, I also just downloaded the new Batman game, which is coming ah, out very tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, I'm really, really interested in that one because I have played, I forget what it's called, but there's an FPS style, sh like, shooter type game uh, that I've played on this one that I recently downloaded last week. And it was super, super fun. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed with this one really, really important too, is that the visuals are a step down from the quest three. And obviously there mm -hmm. is a $200 difference there, but it's definitely noticeable. Uh, there is this thing that you get with VR. It's called the screen door effect where you can kind of see a little bit of lines in between the pixels and it's because there's not as many pixels mm -hmm. going into each of the lenses for the quest 3s so you do notice a little bit less clarity uh for example when you're doing the pass through and you're looking at the room around you and you're just using like like a heads up kind of display with windows in front of you say you're watching youtube or you're just browsing on the internet and using your fingers or your controllers to do some motion uh you can notice a little bit of graininess a little bit of that screen door effect and that would be the biggest difference i would say between the more expensive three and this one yeah, because it's using the same screen as the two, even though it has it some is. of the upgraded sensors. You have the yeah. the new controllers for it, though, right? I do. Yeah, I have those uh, sitting right over here in my little. I have a little package display as well. But these are really good. They're quite intuitive. Um, I've been using these too. I, I did exchange out the AA batteries that they come with, which is great. So you can always just exchange out the batteries, but I do have a wireless charging dock. So I exchanged that out for the little wireless charging ah, okay. batteries yeah, interior. Yeah. So far, haven't had to recharge them at all. They work really good. They're very intuitive. The controls on here, the little joysticks are somewhat small. They're a little bit smaller than what I'm used to when I'm comparing to like my PlayStation or any of my other joysticks. So they are a little bit small, a little bit harder to get used to, but overall these are pretty comfortable to hold. Might get a little sweaty in your palms because it is just, you know, the generic plastic, but mm -hmm. they're pretty decent. So the Quest 3S is 300 bucks. The Quest 3 is 500 bucks. Uh, final yeah. question. If you have a Quest 2, but 500 was too rich for your blood, is it worth it to upgrade to the 3S? And... If you are ready to buy one at all, would you recommend the 3S or the 3? I I would say it comes entirely down to your budget. Because given that this one does have a step down in the visuals from the 3, if you have the money to spend on a Quest 3, then I would say get the Quest 3. Because gotcha. you are going to get that much better like higher than HD resolution uh, for the pixels and the display and the degrees that you can see your field of vision is going to be a little bit farther on the Quest 3 as well. And I have noticed a little bit of a difference when I'm wearing the 3 versus the 3S. If your 2 is a little bit older, if it's showing any age, then yeah, this could be a worthy upgrade for you, but not necessarily something that you do have to put your money into unless you really feel like, yes, I think it's time for an upgrade. Because I know the yeah. Quest 3 or the Quest 2 came out in, what was it, 2021? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been, been a, a few years. Yeah, it's been a few years. So if you're ready to upgrade, then you could definitely look at this one as a worthy competitor. Um, but if you want to spend an extra 200 bucks, then go for the three for the yeah. visuals. Okay. So don't, don't dump your two if it's working for you. Uh, and yes. then, <laughs> you know, get, get the best your money can afford. And, and the three S if, if, if you can afford the three S only, that's fine. Yeah. Sounds like it, like it's decent. Thanks Shannon. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely. That. Absolutely. Uh, Folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at reddit.com slash r slash daily tech news show. 
Last Friday, we did an experimental supersized GDI and talked with Dr. Nikki about what tech neuroscientists use. If you missed it, here's some of the highlights. If you watched or listened back then, thank you. And thanks for letting the rest of the folks hear some of Nikki's insights. You went to a, like the biggest neuroscience conference in the world or something? I went to the CES of neuroscience there you called go. the Society for Neuroscience Meeting, SFN. And, and where was I, this? This was in Chicago last week. There's a lot of tech. So you've got if you've been to a big conference, whether it's scientific or like I was saying, CES, you know, there's like the floor with all the people with have that have expos. And then I don't really know how CES is like, but you've got people probably giving talks. I don't know if you guys have posters, but we also have posters, for example. Uh, my student was giving a poster. And um, so I walked around some of the booths. I looked at some of the more techie things. Some of them wouldn't let me talk to them because <laughs> it was too fancy. Uh, but there was a robot microscope, which I really liked. I think we've got a picture in here somewhere of that. And um, so I talked to two booth people, with, which were very different and no real preference for either of them other than the booths look techie. So I just walked up to them. And then I chatted with a few colleagues who use tech in their neuroscience. I, I, I guess you could say everybody who does neuroscience nowadays uses some form of tech. So it's pretty easy to just grab someone and, and ask them. So um, yeah, we'll just run some clips and, and chat about it, I think. The first one I did is maybe my favorite it's a booth called Backyard Brains, um, and you'll hear about them. And they basically are trying to make neuroscience accessible to kids in school. But I kind of want to buy one of their kits because they're awesome. So do you use tech and neuro? Yeah, so we are doing a computational neuroscience tool for students, high school students to use in classroom. The robot communicates with an app that can run on uh, laptops and uh, tablets and phones. Mm -hmm. And so students can go in and change different uh, properties within the brains. They have different neurons and synapses, different types of neurons, uh, different stimuli. You drag neurons into this workspace uh, and then connect it to the robot's uh, motors and sensors. And then depending on what kind of network you've created for the robot, it's going to behave in different ways. Um, this particular robot is trying to see something. If it sees something red, it's going to start spinning. So it'll, oh, yeah. it'll turn red. And, and this is 3D printed? Yes. yes. Very cool. Um, and so there are different principles of neuroscience in here that students actually use. So recurrent excitation, lateral inhibition between circuits, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we've actually found that students really enjoy this at the moment. I, I would imagine it looks yeah. awesome. Yeah. What's the overall goal for Backyard Brains? So we want to make neuroscience part of secondary education. We want there to be standards in neuroscience and we want there to be experiments available for students to learn hands-on mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom. And so all of our products are basically the ki same kind of neuroscience research tools that you find here, but made easy yeah. uh, for students and made, made affordable and also providing a curriculum around that. And if someone was just interested and wanted to get a robot at home, they can also buy these? Yes, absolutely. We sell to amateurs, we sell to universities. Awesome. Uh, uh, even if, so my name is Christopher Harris. Backyardbrains.com. Backyardbrains All right. You can find us there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's cool. So backyard robots, basically. <laughs> yeah. And, and I really want to buy myself one of these, honestly. And I, um, I had some pics of the booth. It was basically one of the booths that made you want to come up and mess with it. It was just a bunch of wires, a bunch of robots, people plugging stuff in. They had an iPad. Where he was showing me at the time when I was chatting with him about like kind of changing. There we go. Very nice. Uh, connectivity in the brain. And it's just awesome. Uh, I, I love this booth. And I thought this is DTNS people are going to like this stuff. I know yeah. you guys are nerds. <laughs> no, definitely. That's like uh, maker kind of things. Yeah, the brain, yeah totally. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, every year they get more and better and better stuff in there. All right. What about the next one? Let's go. The next one is a different booth, completely different. Um, so from what I got, these guys had kind of like a VR type headset, but it acts kind of like an EEG. And uh, I'll just let them explain that to you. Our device is XR. It is the neural hub, all-in-one neural hub for XR and neurotech related research. Okay. And what we have is 16 channels. Eight, uh, we have six EEG channels. EEG channel is how I get my brain data. And we also have additional eight bipolar channels, which are for e, EXG, e, ECG, EOG, and these are that will be your heart rate or your muscle movement. Anything that happens within the body, you can measure with these bipolar signals. 
And with Exxon R, you can, this is a medical grade research product, and you can use it for research and from anything to diseases like Alzheimer's or ALS. We, we concentrate on ALS, and you can also do research on automating devices like moving a wheelchair so with your brain. How work for that? So what it does is, uh, you can see there are four targets on my screen. Mm -hmm. If I concentrate on one target, it helps me pick that target just with brain signal, nothing else. It's not tracking my eye movement, it's not tracking anything, just with my brain signal, it's helping me make a decision. So what happens in diseases, uh, some diseases, is you cannot always have motor function. You cannot move your hands, you cannot move your legs, you cannot even move your eyes. But with this product, you can still make a decision just with your brain. For example, in ALS, in late-stage ALS, you cannot move your eyes either. And But with this device, you can st late-stage ALS people can still make a decision so on their own. So it translates that? Yes, it oh, translates the brain signals into actual words. That's crazy. It's cool, right? Right. Yeah. Th so there's all kinds of booths like this. Big. There was a whole two rows of booths with EEG caps. I don't know what happened with EEG this year, but they were Busted all over out, the place there. Over. And so I got to watch her wear that. Um, and I'm not gonna. I'm not here to say whether like that's a good product or not. I don't use sure. that in my research. It looked really cool, and that's why I went up to them. But totally. you guys can kind of yeah. see how how we're using tech the one of the taglines for this person was saying it's kind of like Neuralink, except you don't have to implant a chip into the brain which <laughs> yeah, sounded which is pretty great it's helpful. brain computer interface just mm -hmm. external right right yeah, yeah. you know i don't know where they're at with with marketing to the public but i would assume if they're at sfn then they're probably trying to get this out to medical centers and there's all kinds of attendees there so hopefully um this can be helpful for that the next few people I interviewed are other professors who were there presenting their work. So I'll just let you, I'll let them tell you what, what they work on. I'm Liz McCullough. I'm at Oklahoma State University. Uh, we use tech a number of different ways. So we inject viruses in the brain and use it to explore different circuits to try to figure out which areas of the brain are connected to each other. In my teaching, I also use AI a lot to get my students to help them understand scientific papers, so using AI to kind of make a nice synthesis, but then have them critique the use of AI and if it does a good job at talking about science and uh, communicating it well. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So it's a good tool for them to understand the uses and limitations of AI. Okay, she yeah, brought so me I, around, but I was a little scared when she said injecting viruses into brains. <laughs> yeah, I think she works on flies. Or no, actually, she uh, works on okay, rodents. Okay. So yeah. um, that's a, actually a pretty commonplace way of getting vectors into cells is by sure. using a virus. Um, um, yeah, Liz's work is really interesting. I, I got you an AI clip. So, you know, AI was pretty prevalent at the meeting. Our, uh, the first huh? presidential lecture was on whether AI has knowledge. Um, I will say I w walked away with it uh, not having gained any knowledge. So I don't I'm not sure if we ended up defining that or not. I'll play the next clip. This is from actually a great friend of mine, Natalie, who works on naked mole rats. So let's let's roll this one. All right. So how do you use tech in your work? So in my work, I track animals using a computer software that can tell a mouse is darker than the white background and it can follow where that mouse goes. And then I can look at the data afterwards and say, any medical differences that that mouse might be having. Oh, so I'm Dr. Natalie von Kaiserling at Ponce Health Sciences University. I'm an assistant professor of physiology and anatomy, and I use a bunch of naked mole rats. So even though that software is made for mice, because naked mole rats are also darker than the background we use, it can trace them just fine. Wow. So this one's fun, and also because tracking is something that's pretty prevalent in neuroscience right now. I use it for my goats. My colleagues use it for their flies. I've seen it done on zebrafish and um, mice, of course. And it's something that um, my goat one is, is I believe, LLM based. It's called sleep. Um, and there's lots of different ways of doing it, but it's really helpful for like looking at behavioral changes or like posture tracking or changes in locomotion and things like this. And it's, it's becoming very a lot easier to do instead of having grad students analyze the data, we get AI to like pick out patterns. It's a lot better. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Well, Nikki, this was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and let folks know where they can keep up with the work that you do. Yeah, of course. I'm always findable at nicoleackermans.com uh, and uh, also my, my contacts on there, whatever my new projects are. I'm on socials with the same name. So go find me there. 
Excellent. And thank you again, Dr. Nikki, uh, for doing all that hard work, walking around the conference, getting all that. Before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. Just real quickly, want to thank the many of you who expressed your opinions on the experiment from last Friday. Uh, we did DTNS pre-produced and we did GDI as a full hour. Uh, we got all kinds of responses, Shannon, from don't like it to please do this every day. Uh, so uh, at everywhere in between, uh, we'll definitely be taking into account everyone's thoughts. Uh, and and so many people wrote detailed feedback, not just like, no, but like, you know, this is what I like. Oh, this is what I best. didn't. Yeah, yeah, it was really helpful. So uh, we're probably going to try again with another experiment maybe on a Tuesday instead of a Friday, uh, sometime in November. So keep your ears out for that. Before we go, though, uh, thank you, Shannon Morris, for being with us. If people want to find more of what you've got going on, where should they go? YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse is the best place to go. I recently posted a video all about the Z Fold 6. I actually reviewed it in the Highlands Ooh. in Scotland. So I got tons of test footage and I had such a blast. So I would love to travel the world more and test more phones. That Did you bang great. it off some Scottish rocks? in the Highlands? Uh, I, I straight up actually I did and oh, wow. it survived. Um, I, <laughs> I have it right here. It's it's alive. It's perfectly fine. It was charging because hmm. I let it die over the weekend, but wow. it's not my daily driver. So, <laughs> but yes, it survived even though it crashed hard down on the screen. Oh, I, was very, wow. I was very impressed. I was very impressed. Passed the Scottish <laughs> test. Very good. Yeah, it did. Uh, <laughs> well, go check that out. YouTube.com slash Shannon Morris. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. Do you think it's rude to talk to someone with earbuds in your ears. We, we heard a little bit about the Apple hearing aids and people are going to have to keep those in if they want to hear you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the etiquette around wearing earbuds. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>